Um, so our last speaker for the morning session is uh, Michael Mullebach from uh, Max Planck Institute. Yeah. So he's going to talk about towards a systems theory for algorithms. Cool, cool. Really, uh, really nice to be here. And uh, thanks for staying with me um, because you could otherwise go for lunch. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to make it quick and uh, feel free to just interrupt if you have questions. Okay, so in, in a lot of the symposium, um, we learned about how to use dynamical systems to understand physics, right, and to model physical processes and so on. What I'm going to focus on today is to use ideas from dynamical systems and control theory to understand algorithms, and in particular, optimization and learning algorithms. And I'm interested in doing this because I would like to bring, let me see if this works. Machine learning to large scale cyber physical systems, right? And here's uh, three important applications. So in supply chains, we could use machine learning to predict supply or demand shortages and to make sure that we uh, make our supply chains resilient towards disruptions and that we reduce costs. In transportation systems, and I'm going to show you uh, some examples later on, uh, we could use machine learning to predict traffic patterns and as a result, um, optimize and regulate traffic flow. And in industrial processes, uh, we could use machine learning to make these robots more adaptive. Right. And I'm going to also show you an example later on where the robots don't build cars, but they actually play table tennis. Um, but unfortunately, we're not there yet. Right. And there's major challenges despite the huge successes over the last last few years right, or decades. And one of the main challenges is that these systems are extremely complex. They're interconnected. There's different entities that sometimes collaborate, sometimes compete. And there's feedback loops. And to make sure that our learning algorithms and our optimization algorithms actually work is a huge uh, challenge. Then in many cases, collecting data can be very expensive, time consuming. Um, and as we learned this morning, it can be also extremely dangerous. Right? And so we need to find algorithms that are sample efficient. And finally, because these systems are often evolving over time and then changing as we go, uh, we would like to have learning algorithms that apply online, right? So that we can update our parameters in an online uh, manner. And in today's talk, I'm going to give you two examples where we can actually use systems theory and dynamical systems um, to address some of these challenges. And I'm going to show you two examples. The first one is on constraint optimization. And uh, the second, uh, second example is on distributed uh, learning where we can have, where we both uh, use system theoretic tools uh, to design and understand algorithms. And as a result, there's a whole new possibilities that, that uh, arise, right? And I'm also gonna, towards the end of the talk, I'm gonna show you uh, a few examples, right? So let's get started. And um, I'm just gonna illustrate the idea um, on a very, very simple example. So just to make the point extremely clear, so please uh, bear with me. So the example I'm considering, and I'm starting off, is gradient descent, right? So here's gradient descent. Um, we make an update based on the, on the gradient, and t is a time step. And we can now ask ourselves, well, is there, uh, for example, a continuous time dynamical system um, that is such that the trajectory passes through these iterates, right? So that if I evaluate a trajectory at, x, uh, at t times uh, k, then I would like to pass through this iterate xk. Right? And of course, uh, there's an answer to that. It's a backwards error analysis, and there's a, a standard two. But now for, for the sake of example, let's think about a very special case where t is small. Then we get this differential equation, so we get gradient flow. And gradient flow is actually a very cool approximation of gradient descent, and it provides uh, interesting insights, right? So if um, time step is large, the approximation is relatively crude, but if we make the time step smaller, we get a better and better approximation right, to the gradient descent trajectories. Right? And what's nice about this is that it's a very simple model to understand the behavior of this algorithm, gradient descent in this case. So equilibria, very simple set of stationary points. Convergence, well, we just look at how uh, the objective function evolves along trajectories, and we immediately conclude that 
f of x of t converges if f is bound to be low. And we also conclude that if f has isolated the critical points, uh, gradient flow will converge from almost any initial condition. Right? From essentially just this one line, uh, we get extremely uh, powerful results. Right? And here's just an animation that illustrates this point. So different initial conditions that all converge uh, to a local minimum. Right? And so the opportunity is here. Sorry, I'm, it was so rainy this morning. I think I have a problem with my USP. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities here, therefore in using tools from dynamical systems to understand algorithms, and in particular to understand interconnected algorithms, right? Um, and also understand the behavior of algorithms in uh, the setting of, of uh, non-convex or non-linear situations. Right? And we also saw this morning uh, talk about port Hamiltonian systems. So port Hamiltonian systems is beautiful because it allows you to study large interconnected systems. And so in this setting, it would allow you to, inter to study interconnected algorithms. For example, a machine learning pipeline where you have feature extraction and then you do some, some machine learning on top of that and then some decision making, right? It's the entire pipeline. So with setting the stage, I can now dive into really uh, the research. So the first example is on constrained optimization, right? So the problem I'm thinking about is this minimization of a smooth objective, F, and smooth constraints, uh, G. Right? So G are the inequality constraints and F is the objective. And we can construct um, a mechanical system, for example, here a non-smooth one. And this mechanical system is such that the equilibria of the system correspond to the stationary points of the optimization problem. Right? And so if we want to solve the optimization problem, we can also simulate the mechanical system. In this case, we have impacts, for example, uh, because it's not smooth. So when we hit the boundary of the feasible set, we're going to have an impact. And we can wait until we reach an equilibrium the equilibrium will be a stationary point, right? And from a bird's eye view, what's interesting about this formalism is that it gives you a way to play around with constraints, right? So the predominant optimization point of view is that you think about the constraint on the position level. You, you think about constraining the iterate of your algorithm. And, you know, in a caricature way, you can think of projected gradients where you actually take a step on the negative gradient and then you move the iterate, right? But you ensure that the iterate is feasible. And um, in contrast with this dynamical systems approach, um, the way you think about uh, constraints is an interaction between two rigid bodies. So it's the algorithm, point mass, and the constraint, which is another, another uh, rigid body. And the interaction of two rigid bodies is uh, uh, described by forces, right? By an interaction and, and a force law. Right. And so, for example, you can move position constraints to a velocity level. So here, the natural thing to say is the forward velocity should be the tangent cone of the feasible set uh, at all times. Right. And in continuous time, these are equivalent. And the nice thing is that for feasible sets that are uh, regular, and this is the setting we're usually thinking about in optimization, the tangent cone is actually a convex object. And so we start with this potentially very complex uh, non-convex feasible set. And if we just think about the tangent cone, we, we, we have just to work with, with convex objects. And another advantage is that um, if you think of this constraint function G, right, it turns out that the tangent cone is only spanned by a few constraints, usually the constraints that are closed at this current position. Right? So if you're at x1 here, then the tangent cone is spanned by these two rays, right? If you're at x2, it's just this half space. So very, very simple uh, and very convenient to work with. The question is, of course, I can use that, yeah, actually. Thanks. Okay. Does this work now? Okay, okay. Okay, so the question is, if we now go to discrete time, right, and we use these ideas, do we get an algorithm that actually works, right? And uh, so I worked on this, and, and here's the result. So indeed, you can do uh, gradient descent, right, where again, the idea is 
to essentially use a local approximation of the feasible set that is sparse, that depends on a very few constraints, the ones which are active or closed at this current position. Right? Um, and it turns out that if you have, for example, a strongly convex setting, then you get linear convergence uh, where you'd get the typical, square, uh, typical kappa uh, dependency. Um, and we can also add momentum and then you get essentially accelerated convergence where you, you scale with the square root of uh, kappa. So kappa is here the condition number of the Lagrangian. And we also have results on the non-convex setting where you need to use uh, a diminishing uh, step size. But the interesting, mathematically, the challenge here is that the feasible set or this approximation of the feasible set, this V alpha, uh, essentially changes at every iteration. Right? And so analyzing this algorithm is, is, is quite challenging. And I can highlight here uh, one, one of the peculiarities, uh, so one of the technical details. And so this is a very simple example. So let's say we look at this quadratic and the feasible set is the green region. So just one dimensional, just very, very simple. And we can then compute in closed form um, this velocity V, um, which, um, yeah, which is uh, described here, right? And if we plot this, then if we're feasible, we just follow the negative gradient. Um, and if we're, if we're not feasible, so if we're x is less than zero, um, this constraint, we violate one constraint. So the constraint tells us we should move to the right with at least a velocity alpha g1, a little bit to the right, right? And if we violate the second constraint, we should move to the left with this amount alpha g2, right? But the tricky thing is that this is a system where the equilibrium is not stable, right? It's, it's attractive, but not stable, right? Because if you start here for positive values of x, you're gonna make a few relatively large steps and a large step to the negative uh, wheels, and then you approach uh, from the left, right? Whereas if you start from the left, you're just gonna uh, converge, converge to zero. And zero is really the, the solution at this point, right? And uh, so, so indeed, for example, you cannot find um, a smooth Lyapunov function. In this case, you have to find something discontinuous that respects this behavior. And the key for analyzing this is to somehow think of the boundary between feasible and infeasible points as a semi-permeable membrane. So trajectories can go one from one side to the other, but not vice versa. Right. So that's uh, the technical uh, glimpse of the technical details. Now, well, does it actually work, right? Does it, does it actually work on, on the reasonable problem? Um, and so here's uh, very simple experiments where I randomly generated dense quadratic programs. And uh, so on the x-axis is problem size, on the y-axis is execution time, and I compare to an interior point method. And with the interior point method, you look at every, you include every constraint as a barrier function, right? Whereas with the method I uh, propose, at every iteration, you just look at what are the constraints which are currently violated. Right? And as a result, you get a much better scaling uh, with, with the problem size. Right? And uh, similarly, you can do just region problems uh, where, where you get similar speed ups. But what's also nice about the method is that you can use it for online learning. So here's an online learning setting um, where you have constraints. So maybe to remind you, um, how, how does online learn, uh, learning work? So at every iteration, there's a decision maker that has to choose this uh, solution X of T, right? And only after you've committed to this solution X of T, you get information. And in this case, you get information about the objective, right? An adversary chooses your objective function and you get information about to violate the constraints. So in my setting, I only get information about some constraints which are violated. So I have to discover the, the feasible set in a piece by piece manner. Right. And it turns out that the algorithm I showed you actually achieves um, these regret guarantees, um, which in this setting are optimal. So you get square root t regret. So regret means you compare the performance of the decision maker compared to what you could have achieved had you known all these functions ahead of time. Right. And you also get uh, conversions to the feasible set at this typical square root, square root t rate. Right. Here's another uh, application. So we also looked at stochastic optimization over the Stiefel manifold. Um, and it turns out that 
out of this formalism, you get a very efficient algorithm that allows you uh, to do this. And uh, so in the Stiefel manifold, the setting you're usually interested or the setting we looked at is where n is large and m is small, right? And then the per iteration complexity of this algorithm is order of n, right? So it means that it, it, it scales well uh, with n, right? And um, optimization of the Schieffel manifold has many applications in, in machine learning. It's been very trendy uh, recently because people figured out that if you pose orthogonality constraints on your weight matrices, uh, the, the networks tend to generalize better. But of course, there's also many uh, classical statistical problems uh, where you need to compute orthogonal matrices, for example, in shape analysis, where you'd like to, have, where you have two data sets and you'd like to find an orthogonal transformation that matches the two, right? And this is applications in biology and medicine and so on. Right. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, using system theory and dynamical system to understand the dynamics of this constraint optimization algorithm. Now in the second part, I'm gonna talk about distributed optimization and distributed learning. And so, and this work is essentially motivated by the fact that we have to solve ever larger optimization problems uh, with more and more data, right? And the way in machine learning this is typically done is uh, with the following approach, right? So you have an interaction between a server uh, that coordinates the process and clients, and these clients have local data sets, right? So these local data sets give rise to local loss functions, fi, right? And, but what you ultimately want to minimize is uh, the finite sum, right? And so a very simple algorithm um, that's it's widely used it works as follows, right? At every iteration, the server chooses a random set of clients these clients perform a local uh, minimization, and uh, after that, they will return their answer, and there's gonna be some average. Right. Very simple, and it's uh, very effective. But in some situation, it, it, it doesn't work. Right. And I guess you can, you can tell me an example where, where there's an issue uh, with this. Maybe someone. So I will, I will tell you the answer, <laughs> or, or one example. So one example is when the local data sets are vastly different, right? If they're non-IID, right, then these local minima over just one of these data sets, the minimizer of these are largely different to the finite sum minimizer, right? And, uh, and this is what you see here. So this is work uh, by my PhD student. So she looked at, this, at a situation where you have digits, so it's an MNIST problem and every agent or every client had access to only one digit, right? But what you would like to get ultimately is a, is a model that generalizes across all digits. Um, but the, the methods, uh, these, these averaging methods don't work, right? Because the local minima are different than the global ones. And uh, the method she proposes uses systems theory and achieves a much better trade-off. So here the trade-off is in terms of accuracy versus communication load, right? And, the way this works is uh, using event-based communication. So uh, we base this algorithm on ADMM and we introduce an event-based communication. So you only communicate if there's a significant change, right? So more precisely, this works as follows. So there's still a server uh, that minimizes a local problem over G, G could be a regularizer or a feasible set. Um, and then only if there's a large change you communicate uh, the Z variable to, to each of the agents. The agents perform a local minimization and the local minimization is regularized in a very particular way so that you ensure that the local minima then give rise to the converge to the global minima. Right? And then you have the event-based communication. And systems theory provides, uh, provides us a tool for analyzing these dynamics. Right? And in particular here, uh, the challenge is to understand how the disturbance arising from this event-based communication actually enters the dynamics. And uh, Dilshad found that, so my PhD student found, uh, essentially a set of linear matrix inequalities that guarantee convergence at a certain rate. Right. But she didn't stop there. She actually found a closed form solution to these linear matrix inequalities. And this closed form solution then gives really a closed form uh, rate. Right. So a closed form expression for the convergence rates. Right. And uh, we also did experiments then 
on uh, really uh, machine learning data sets. So here's an image classification data set where you can reduce uh, communication load by about 70% without losing much, much accuracy. And uh, you can also do it on graphs. And if you do it on graphs, then the impact of doing event-based communication is actually really significant. So it's much, much better to do this event-based uh, communication than just a random selection of, of agents. Yeah. Okay, so this concludes uh, the second part, the second uh, example of where system theory can be used to analyze algorithms. Now let me show you some, some of the real-world real -world examples. So the first example is uh, a traffic problem. Uh, so this is joint work by uh, another group leader at Max Planck. Um, so it's Katerina de Bacco. And uh, she's interested in solving these tra transportation problems. So she models traffic uh, flow by solving this minimization problem. So you, you minimize the cost and then uh, you essentially have the flow which is given by a conductivity times the pressure difference and you have Kirchhoff's law, right? But now what's, what's the interesting thing is that we can now add constraints. So we can add constraints that are, for example, non-convex, such as, uh, in this case, this infrastructure uh, constraint. So this exponent gamma is um, uh, less than one, or it can be less than one, which gives rise to a non-convex constraint. But despite the fact that we have this non-convex constraint, we can apply the algorithm I showed you earlier, and we get actually a closed form expression for going from one iterator to the next. So we can run this on really large, large problems, and we can use that to, for example, predict uh, the passenger flow in the bus network of Grenoble. So Grenoble is a, a city in, in France. Here's, here's another uh, example, more closely related to, to dynamical systems. Um, so this is work by my PhD student, Yasan. And Yasan is interested in um, controlling, very accurately controlling and manipulating uh, the magnetic field inside this workspace. So he has eight coils and he would like to manipulate this workspace, uh, the, the field in this, in this workspace. And why do you want to do this? Well, because you want to, you want to essentially control um, a small robot in here, and this can be used, uh, for example, in medicine to actually move a robot inside your body or move a catheter inside your body. Um, but until now, these systems have mainly been driven open loop, so you set a certain, a certain current, right? And this gives rise to a uh, magnetic field and uh, then you observe how the, how the robot moves and you do it in a remote control way. But Yasan and I, we're control engineers, so we'd like to push the boundaries of what we can do is, and we'd like to introduce feedback and to be able to dynamically uh, reduce disturbances, right? And so in order to showcase that we can actually use feedback here and uh, that these coils have actually a high bandwidth. Um, we set ourselves a task to balance inverted pendulums, an inverted pendulum system. So the bottom part here is actuated. So the bottom part has these permanent magnets. Uh, so this can be actuated, but the upper part is not actuated. So you have to really move the bottom part to, to balance the upper one. Right? And uh, we can then also use uh, the online optimization approach, online learning approach, um, that I showed you earlier to actually get offset re reference uh, tracking. So Yasan uses this to essentially track different trajectories. So for example, circles or, or this uh, figure eight right, in, a, in, an off in, in an offset free manner. And uh, just recently he actually managed uh, for the first time to control uh, the magnetic field, not at a single position, but at, at two positions. So on, on, on the left, you see a video of this. So he, he actually is now able to stabilize two pendula um, simultaneously, and these two pendula are located at different positions. So this really requires precise control uh, and feedback control, so dynamic disturbance attenuation at two different uh, independent locations. Right? And the right is just some uh, long aperture image uh, with an LED on top. It just gives a nice picture. Okay. And uh, before we go for lunch, I have the last example. Um, and so here, uh, we actually use um, some of the online learning ideas to drive this robot arm. And um, this robot arm, what's interesting about this robot arm is that it's, well, it can play table tennis, but it's also actuated by pneumatic artificial muscles, right? So the way these devices work is that you fill them with pressurized air, 
and then they will uh, contract. And you can then use two muscles, um, so in an agonist antagonist pair, to drive a joint. Right? And uh, we use that to play table tennis. Um, and so here's a video that shows how this works. So it's actually, we updated our design recently, so it's actually quite fast, right? So that's really one advantage of this actuation. So that's why the project is so interesting because it's a new type of actuation that uh, has an extremely high bandwidth. Right? The, so it's, it's challenging to play with this robot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so with that, I would like to come back to the opening theme, right? So I showed you how we can solve constrained optimization problems, or one approach in which we can solve constrained op optimization problems at scale. And I think constraints are very important for guaranteeing safety and reliability. Then in this uh, last example, but I didn't have the chance to talk about, um, we actually use physical prior knowledge to get approximate information about the gradients. And uh, this leads to a very simple, efficient uh, learning approach. And uh, I also showed you how, how we can um, a technique to actually come up with an online uh, learning learning approach. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my students, and I would like to thank you for uh, the attention. And thank you very much.